Hello and welcome to the Scottish Parliament's virtual question time today on the subject of the rural economy and tourism. Uh, as normal, I'm joined by ministerial colleagues and MSPs from around the country from their homes and constituencies. And we're going to start with the first question from Maureen Watt. Ms Watt. Thing officer, my question is to the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Economy and Tourism. So, can, Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you what progress is being made in getting support to the seafood and fishing industry? Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Thank, thank you, President Officer. Uh, uh, and we are providing substantial financial support to the fishing industry. The package of Financial support is a total of just under £23 million, uh, and it forms three different schemes. Uh, first of all, we wanted to assist those uh, with vessels of 12 metres and under. Uh, secondly, some of the vessels over 12 metres. And thirdly, to shellfish processors uh, and others who are facing severe difficulties because of the loss of markets for their produce. Um, I'm very pleased that we've been able to provide this support, uh, and I, the purpose, presiding officer, is to address financial hardship. In other words, um, businesses, fishermen or shellfish producers, uh, who effectively have no or very little income at this time, but still have overheads to pay. So the packages have been tailored with the objective of trying to assist them in meeting those unavoidable fixed outlays to tide them over till, uh, as we all hope, the COVID crisis is over. And a supplementary from Maureen Ward. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for that answer. We know that some enterprising fish merchants have taken to the road to sell their fish products, but how can consumers find out if there is a fishman indeed coming to their area so that they can eat the healthy fish? Well, I think you're right, and I've seen examples around the country of uh, ingenuity, entrepreneurship of, of individuals uh, taking action themselves to, to sell their own produce. Uh, uh, and uh, there, there is in, indeed some information available online in relation to Scotland food and drink and direct deliveries, and local information is also available about uh, being able to access. I think one of the things uh, on a wider note, signing officer, that we may see is almost a legacy from COVID is that um, people are becoming more used to working online and therefore will perhaps uh, avail themselves of purchasing food uh, online rather than of necessity in, uh, in shops or supermarkets. Uh, and that, I think, would be um, a step forward for the food and drink sector in Scotland. And Scotland Food and Drink and the Scottish Government are working. Uh, hard to, uh, to to enable that for, for more people as a, a workable option. Thank you very much. We're going to go to Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Claire Baker. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And my question is for the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Economy and Tourism. Cabinet Secretary, yesterday the UK Government announced a new fund uh, for dairy farmers. Uh, to enable them to cope with the impact of coronavirus. The new fund will help support dairy farmers who have been affected substantially uh, by the reduction in demand from restaurants, cafes and bars. Dairy farmers in Scotland are facing the same financial hardship, as you will know, Cabinet Secretary. And I believe that a new fund would give essential support to them to cover the lost income and the excess milk and the falling prices. Our dairy industry, as you know, plays a crucial part in the Scottish economy. And I want to ask you if you will stand alongside our dairy farmers through this difficult period and introduce a similar hardship fund. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Uh, sorry, also, I'm, I'm pleased that this question has been raised. Uh, first of all, uh, let, let me reassure, reassure the member that we are working extremely closely in Scotland with the NFUS and others and the sector uh, to ensure that we are able to take whatever steps are necessary to assist. We have also have been working very closely with the with DEFRA, with George Eustace, and I have had discussions with him, as indeed have uh, my officials with his officials. I know that there was an announcement yesterday evening of the outline of a scheme by the UK government. Um, 
uh, I believe the details of those have not yet been finalised. Uh, we are working closely with the UK government and Scottish stakeholders uh, to consider whether such uh, assistance is necessary in Scotland. Uh, the assistance is of a relatively limited nature, as I understand it, um, but nonetheless, it could be of real assistance to those farmers in Scotland who are suffering hardship. They are those who are, uh, were supplying, if you like, the the, uh, the the restaurant, the the, the on market, rather than directly to supermarkets. Uh, so it's a distinct group, uh, some of whom who have suffered considerable financial loss. Just finally, presiding officer. Um, we are also contributing, as are the other devolved administrations, to the costs of a marketing campaign to promote uh, the consumption of milk at this time. Milk is a highly nutritious product, uh, particularly good, I think, for healthy bones and children and so on. Uh, and we are contributing money from the Scottish Government to a marketing campaign right now, which will be led by the AHDB, and we are very pleased to play a part. And I will report back to members as soon as we have been able further to give consideration to the question of whether a financial package of support uh, is required and should be provided in Scotland, and if so, full details, presiding officer, will be provided to the REC committee as soon as possible. Thank you. Claire Baker to be followed by John Finney. Claire Baker. Thank you, presiding officer. I believe this question would be for Minister Mary Goujon. The Association of Scottish Visitors Attractions have warned that some 80% of visitor attractions could go out of business during the coronavirus crisis. Deep Sea World and the St Andrews Aquarium are both in my region, and the current circumstances are extremely challenging. DEFRA announced £14 million for a, for a zoo support fund this week um, to support zoos and aquariums, who, while they are able to access the support to furlough staff, and hibernate the business, they still have to provide care for the animals. Will a comparable fund be introduced in Scotland to support this unique sector? Now, although uh, I believe the member indicated this was for Marie Goujon, I have seen the Cabinet Secretary is indicating that he wishes to respond. Fergus Ewing. Uh, well, I think my colleague Marie Goujon has, resp Marie Goujon has responsibility for um, certain matters relating to animal health and welfare, but I have responsibility for tourism, so um, I, I don't think we're going to wrangle over it. But I certainly have been dealing closely with the Association of Scottish Visitor Attractions uh, and had a conference call with Gordon and Susan Morrison uh, fairly recently. I'm aware, acutely aware, of the pressures facing uh, a, a huge range of visitor attractions in Scotland, uh, particularly those that are dependent on international visitors who have. Uh, not only hard hit, as they all are at the moment, being shut, frankly, but, but also because they are very worried that there will not be an easy resumption or recovery, even if restrictions are lifted, because so many visitors are international. In relation to the particular question asked, I will look carefully into the question of whether or not uh, the, the, there is a specific uh, fund that, that should be applied. But I do understand that the funds that were announced uh, last week by my colleague, the Finance Secretary, a, including PERF fund, uh, are funds which are designed to enable uh, those businesses that uh, are, are eligible to obtain financial assistance, and I expect that that would include some members of the Association of Visitor Attractions. Thank you. I believe Claire Baker would like a brief supplementary. Claire Baker. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to look at this, but does he recognise that zoos and aquariums do offer a unique visitor attraction, and they have a responsibility to care for the animals while this closure is ongoing. And I do understand that they have tried to apply for the additional funds the Scottish Government have offered, but so far haven't been successful. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I entirely accept that the zoos and aquaria provide a, 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 a very pleasant, educative, uh, and enjoyable business, business experience. And indeed, I myself, my family visited Edinburgh Zoo not so very long ago, uh, uh, and uh, therefore I entirely agree with Claire Baker's assertion. It's entirely correct, and also that they have responsibilities uh, to look after animals or or fish, and they're responsible for their welfare, and that is something that must uh, of which regard must be had. The funds that were announced uh, just last week are only just opened, and therefore I think it is fairly early days yet. But but I'm very happy to. Uh, consider uh, uh, how we can address the, the particular needs of the businesses concerned, and I will ask my officials to make investigations 
a, of that particular issue. I'm very happy Presiding Officer Claire Baker wishes to provide me with any further information there and end. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. John Finney to be followed by Lee MacArthur. John Finney. Um, thank you very much indeed, President Officer. My question is for the Cabinet Secretary, and it's about tourism. Cabinet Secretary, you'll be well aware of a, a, a tension that exists in the Highlands and Islands regarding the pressure of businesses who want to start and the resident population who are very concerned about any erosion of the high standards that apply at the moment regarding protection. Indeed, you may be aware that Park Dean Resorts, as early as this morning, were taking bookings from the 16th of May. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what discussions he's had with his UK counterpart, perhaps particularly in light of potential announcements from them, about the coordination um, of any tourism um, resumption um, in the time ahead, please? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President, there's two parts to that, first, that question. The, the first part relates to a particular business that has establishments in the Highlands, two caravan parks. And, my understanding is that that business has made it absolutely clear that it is not reopening at the current time, uh, and uh, that information I received from Trading Standards just this morning. So I, I think I should say, out of fairness to the business, whom I have not yet been able to contact directly, uh, but in respect of whom certain issues were raised in the press, I believe just yesterday evening, that according to local Trading Standards officers, no offence has been committed. The business is acting responsibly, as I would expect it to do as a major responsible business. Secondly, with regard to the UK government, yes, Mr Finney is correct. I, I think that in general terms, there, there is concern amongst many communities uh, throughout the Highlands and throughout the country that just at the moment, it would not be safe to lift restrictions uh, and therefore that people coming into an area may indeed bring with them an increased risk of spread of the virus. I think that's perfectly fair comment and is undoubtedly the case at present. Uh, plainly, we and the UK government have a responsibility that, at, as at such time as it is safe to do so, that clear messaging is provided uh, and that care is taken that in lifting restrictions, as we do that when it is safe to do so, and I stress not before, that that is accompanied by very clear messaging to reassure the public, but also to make sure that every business uh, respects the COVID rules of uh, social distancing. Uh, at that time and applies them as they are at that time. And just to finish to Mr. Finney's question, uh, it's a very serious question indeed. I discussed these very issues this morning in a conference call with uh, Nigel Duddleston, my UK counterpart, and colleagues from Wales and Northern Ireland. And I think it's uh, an issue that is recognised as one that we must address in all parts of these islands. Thank you very much. Lee MacArthur to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Lee MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, over recent weeks, the Rural Secretary and I have discussed how vital local wholesalers are to the uh, Orkney economy. Of course, they're not the only businesses that play uh, such a pivotal role. Uh, Orkney Cheese, for example, uh, operates as a cooperative, uh, supports a number of local dairy farms, as well as various businesses producing everything from uh, smoked cheese to ice cream, all of the very highest uh, quality. But these are challenging times. But the implications of uh, these sorts of businesses uh, failing would be serious and widely felt. I welcome, therefore, the decision to set up the Pivotal Enterprise Resilience Fund to uh, support businesses that are linchpins within their local economies. Does the uh, Cabinet Secretary agree that the wholesalers and the cheese are just the sort of businesses that epitomise this and that need to be supported uh, to continue playing the, the vital role that they do within the local economy? Have yes, I, I, th I think I, I would largely agree with, with Mr MacArthur, and uh, he is right that Orkney Cheese is uh, an excellent business. I've, I visited it uh, a couple of years back uh, and spoke to some of the farmer members uh, 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 and uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, an enthusiastic consumer of their products. And um, I am in contact with that business with regard to potential financial support to which they may be eligible, and I believe that I may have been contacted as, as recently as yesterday by correspondence. I will check that up and make sure that the member is informed. Uh, the general point, though, presiding officer, yes, the, the fund um, is intended to benefit businesses such as these. I believe that some uh, member, some wholesalers in Scotland have already availed themselves of 
applications to the fund, uh, and uh, that that's a good thing. Um, and we will obviously be keeping members advised as the fund uh, progresses and as applications are processed from uh, from that fund. I think the the last thing I would say is that there is an overriding concern that these funds may not provide sufficient financial support to to deal with all of the hardship that is caused by businesses around the country. I just make that general point, and it's one that indeed I made to the UK minister this morning to whom I spoke, as I do think we do need to do more across these islands to make sure that businesses can navigate this crisis. And at the moment, I do not think that we're yet able quite to achieve that, presiding officer. And I think it's best to be transparent and open about that fact right now, but reassure people watching this Scottish Parliament session that we are aware of it, but we are doing everything we can to deal with it to the best of our ability and the, the availability of, of uh, financial resources. Thank you. Question from Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Peter Chapman. Stuart Stevenson. As this uh, COVID pandemic international trade, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what discussions he has had with the UK Government and perhaps with others about the continuation from 2021 of protected geographical indications for Scottish food products, which is so essential to continuing recognition in export markets where the superior quality of products from Scotland is understood? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, the, the PGIs are extremely valuable for Scotland. Uh, I, our quality beef, uh, Scotch lamb, Scotch beef, uh, specially selected pork, uh, as well as like our bro smokies, have a particular cachet, and the conferral of PGI status brings with it a commercial premium, an additional value, uh, so that the the uh, the production of, of these high quality foodstuffs uh, is extremely important to the rural economy in Scotland. Um, this is a more of a, a Brexit issue, I think, than, than a COVID issue. And one concern about Brexit is that we would perhaps lose the benefits of these PGIs because uh, we may no longer enjoy the recipro reciprocal arrangements that we have in the EU, where you know we recognise par Parmesan cheese, uh, or, or for example, will that reciprocity be there? It's hugely valuable because it's the European markets where these premiums are earned and received. And the loss of that PGI status, which could result from Brexit without possibly a similar replacement, is something that has caused us concern and something, uh, to answer Mr. Stevenson's question, that I have raised repeatedly with various DEFRA ministers. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm on my fourth or fifth DEFRA Secretary of State, as it were, at the moment, a presiding officer. But, but uh, we will certainly continue to press the case for preservation of this enormous benefit to a Scottish prime produce. Thank you. Peter Chapman to be followed by Alistair Allen. Peter Chapman. Of the Cabinet Secretary, Fergus Ewing. Uh, presenting officer, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that our white fish fleet are voluntarily restricting their days at sea to ensure the market is supplied but not swamped. Die anything for a month. However, when they return to their traditional fishing grounds, they find line and gill net vessels from Spain and France moving in on these traditional Scottish fishing areas and refusing to move. What on-sea support can the Scottish Government provide to our fishermen who should not have to tolerate such inexcusable behaviour by foreign vessels? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't catch all of that, but I think I did catch the gist of it, Presiding Officer. So my apologies in advance if, if I don't uh, respond in, in a way that reflects the totality of the question. But what I would say is that I did hear Mr. Chapman say that uh, arrangements had been made in relation to how whitefish vessels operate at present time in, in a coordinated fashion, and that's to avoid the market being swamped, as I think Mr. Chapman said, and I believe that those arrangements are broadly welcomed. That's my under, my information, although uh, I, I, I'm happy to 
speak to Mr Chapman about the should he so wish. Uh, I have discussed with uh, a Scotland's most senior fisheries official these arrangements and understand that they are designed to, to have this salutary effect. The second question he raised would be about uh, a, a illicit activity. Any illicit activity needs to be reported to Marine Scotland and marine protection vessels uh, uh, deployed if, if necessary, uh, but the marine protection staff deal with any such incident. Uh, these matters are very often raised in the press, but sometimes it's the case that there is a lacking in lacking in specification about the details of the vessel, the infringement, the encroachment. All I would say to Mr Chapman is that I'm very happy if he wishes to write to me with any specific information to pursue that with Marine Scotland. And I know that their staff uh, who deal with fisheries protection, both in the vessels and on shore, are extremely professional and very well regarded within fisheries circles. So I do believe and I I'm able to assert that they take their discharge, they discharge their duties in a professional uh, and effective manner. Thank you. Now, conscious, we've still got four more members who wish to get in uh, before two o'clock or around two o'clock, if possible. But Peter Chapman, with a very brief supplementary. Peter Chapman. Uh, just in case the cabinet secretary didn't quite hear, I, my point was that on sea these vessels are encountering foreign vessels in their traditional grounds and refusing to move to allow them to come back to fish, and that was the point. We need to insist that uh, the best possible uh, opportunity for our fishermen to get into their traditional grounds is maintained. Cabinet secretary. Well, of course, we 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 uh, wish to ensure that that happens. And as I say, any uh, reports of uh, illegal activity uh, should be reported clearly and will be investigated by the relevant authorities. Thank you. Now, Alistair Allen to be followed by Colin Smith. Alistair Allen. The Cabinet Secretary will recognise, I know, that uh, there are a large number of seasonal businesses in my own constituency and others like it. Um, these are facing the prospect of having to go from September 2019, very probably until Easter 2021, with virtually no income. Uh, while certainly recognising the need for the current restrictions, um, can the Cabinet Secretary say what is being done to recognise the particularly difficult position which is faced by communities? such as my own, which are, are very dependent on seasonal businesses. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I, th I think Dr Allen makes a, a very strong point, and one which applies to many of our islands and indeed more remote rural communities, that, um, that uh, various types of activities are, uh, for example, tourism, are of a highly seasonal nature, and therefore those businesses tend to derive uh, what income they have between a, a, the kind of Easter and autumn months by and large, and that's not only a factor for tourism, but other areas in the economy as well. And of course, the the uh, impacts on tourism of COVID have been extreme. I mean, there is basically no tourism at the moment, and indeed, many tourism activities are uh, offences at the moment, as we've touched on earlier. So there, I think there is a, a need to recognise amongst governments that the impacts of post-COVID are going to be very serious indeed, especially on our islands, and especially on those communities whose survival depends upon the continuance of successful, seasonally conducted uh, economic activities. I think as a general proposition, I entirely accept that, uh, and indeed the, it, it is difficult to overstate the concern that we have about uh, the particular the tourism uh, businesses on us, and I have discussed this with the uh, with the Hebrides uh, tourism body uh, fairly recently, who offered the view that they don't really expect presiding officers there to be any significant recovery this year at all for a, the for, for the Outer Hebrides, for example, which is a pretty bleak um, prognosis. Uh, so it is a, it's a, it, our responsibility to work with Dr. Allen, with the local authority, with the local MP. Uh, to address these problems in an effective fashion, uh, and we will we will certainly be doing that. Thank you very much. Colin Smith, be followed by Richard Lyle. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, my question is to the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy. 
The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that while there has been sector-specific financial support for bus companies that provide timetable services through, for example, the continuation of the concessionary travel reimbursement, there has not been any sector-specific support for those companies which only provide coach hire services. They would normally be gearing up for the, the busy tourism period just now, but we know that tourism is likely to be the, one of the last sectors to leave lockdown and recover. So, Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, is the government considering specific sector support to the many hundreds of coach firms struggling at this time? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I, I have this morning written to, um, I think, about 20 or 30 coach companies who have written to me in the past 24, 48 hours expressing concerns of this nature. Uh, and I am to have a meeting, a, a conference call meeting, with the CPT, the trade body, in the course of the next few days, uh, as quickly as it can be arranged. And I think that is in course right now. Um, I have indicated in a letter that I have sent to all these businesses, uh, or is being sent today, that we value the work they do, that the high-quality coaches uh, give our visitors to Scotland a, 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 a comfortable experience and a way to enjoy the scenery of the country. They also take visitors to and from cruise liners, to visitor resorts, to hotels. Uh, tours are arranged through a number of coach companies. Many coach companies are either wholly or substantially reliant upon tourism, uh, and therefore I do believe there is an extremely strong case that, just like other businesses in the tourism sector, have already received support. So, uh, coach companies who are substantially in the tourism sector and who are suffering hardship because of the COVID restrictions uh, should, in principle, also be able to be afforded whatever protection is required to help them navigate these difficult times. So I'm very pleased that uh, an opportunity has been provided for me to make that clear. The last point I would make, presiding officers, just this morning, I made this point, uh, this exact same point, to the UK tourism minister. He discussed a, a, an example of a business down south, a coach business, uh, and I added my voice for there to be a specific. Uh, a consideration of support for this important part of our tourism economy. He agreed it was a, a sensible point, well made, and he's passing that on to the UK Cabinet. Thank you. Richard Lyle to be followed by Edward Mountain. Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. My question is to the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary, can you indicate what the impact has been of recruitment campaigns to provide seasonal workers for Scotland's farmers. Cabinet Secretary. I think, actually, Presiding Officer, with your permission, I think uh, 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 Ms. Goujon may be uh, uh, better able to deal with this, as I know she has been working very hard on this area, with your permission. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. So, Minister for Natural Affairs, uh, Marie Goujon. Thank you. A range of platforms and campaigns which have been running to try and recruit seasonal workers from not just within Scotland but right across the UK. So, for example, Lantra, we've been working with them and they've been doing a skills matching service. Uh, and also, the NFUS have been hosting a website to try and link up job opportunities uh, with the growers themselves as well. But I think what we are hearing from growers right now is the fact that even though, I mean, I think some of these websites have been getting tens of thousands of hits, so there's been a lot of interest there, but that interest isn't necessarily translating into to applications. So there's been quite a low conversion rate there, and there's also a mixture of factors as well. So when it comes to uh, those uh, end up um, taking those opportunities and working on farm. They're not always able to commit to working through the whole season because obviously there's a, a variety of reasons why people have gone for these job opportunities. For example, furloughed workers who then find that they then have to return to work. So we're absolutely aware of how key an, an issue this is to fruit and veg production. So that's why we're continuing to monitor the situation closely. And we're engaging regularly with the producers and stakeholder representatives. Thank you very much. Now, I believe uh, your correct title is Minister for Rural Affairs and the Natural Environment rather than the Minister for Natural Affairs. A very brief supplementary from uh, Richard Lyle. Richard Lyle. Yes, thank, you, thank you, President Officer. Minister, I know this uh, also affects your particular area, but as 
as I am a member of the Rural Affairs Committee, I'd be interested to know what support is available to uh, fruit and vegetable farmers with concerns over workforce availability. Minister Barry Gujon. Uh, just as I said in my previous response, we have been working really closely with the sector table meeting vegetable uh, sector representatives and we have I think the the workforce is a standing item on that agenda and uh, what these weekly meetings do is they essentially provide us with the opportunity for growers to discuss all the particular problems that they have right now as well as looking at what we as a government can do to try and support them in any of those challenges that they face so uh, an example of some of that work recently has been that uh, we worked with the sector to produce sector-specific guidance uh, for uh, for social distancing, for example, because there are very particular challenges within each of those different areas as well. And we're also working closely with them on potential activity to recruit migrant workers from the EU, uh, and that's something that would normally happen. But we are continuing to work with them on that. Thank you very much. And Edward Mountain. Thank you, presiding. Thank, thank you, presiding officer. And I would like to remind you and members of my interests in farming. Two weeks ago, cabinet secretary, I raised with you the devastating prospect facing thousands of malting barley growers if whisky distilleries remain closed for safety reasons and their barley is not required. Can you confirm what discussions, meetings, or telephone calls you've had in the last two weeks? to ensure that distillers stand by their primary producers and suppliers. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Um, well, yes, I, I'm acutely aware, as I as indicated before to the member, that, that uh, a, the um, arable farmers in Scotland, a, 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 their financial returns are, are dependent on a functioning whisky sector. In other words, it's the operation Whisky distilling is obviously based upon the primary product of, of barley, and therefore the barley market is essential. And the concern is that unless uh, whisky distilling is able to resume, the, there could be very significant difficulties in that sector. To answer Mr. Mountain's question, presiding officer, I, I have had a lengthy and very useful discussion with the. Uh, a farmer who is the combined, uh, the chair of the combined arable uh, cereal committee of the NFUS. That's Willie Thompson. Uh, and uh, at that meeting, it was agreed that I would also seek to have discussions with other stakeholders, including maltsters and others, in uh, working closely in the sector. And it's a sector where I've visited many establishments, such as uh, uh, Highland Grain, for example, in my my own uh, area of Scotland. Um, uh, and I also expressed a desire to attend and take part in the relevant meeting of the group that deals regularly with these issues. Now, uh, I asked whether that meeting could be brought could be brought forward. I, I think the meeting is going to take place, presiding officer, on the 28th of May. Just yesterday, I was informed that that's the case. Now, obviously, the restrictions are in place at the moment, um, and we perhaps don't expect them to be lifted in the immediate term. Between now and the 28th of May, to answer the question, I will be doing further work with further engagement, as will my officials, to prepare the ground in some of the complex issues that are involved here. But the aim is to ensure that, uh, assuming that we can see the restrictions lifted over the coming weeks and months, that whisky distilling will be able to be resumed, uh, and that working together, all the sector can uh, as, can uh, make effective arrangements to avoid a collapse in the price. It's, uh, as Mr. Mountain knows, this is not an entirely straightforward issue, but I can assure him, absolutely assure him, that it's one that's receiving both my and my officials' full attention. Thank you very much. And can I say thank you to all my ministerial and MSP colleagues today? Uh, we're going to resume with health and sport questions in about 10 minutes' time. Uh, but in the meantime, can I thank you for your participation and I suspend this meeting. <laughs>